Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and uh, it's nice to be back here this morning. Please forgive my laryngitis for whatever reason. My voice is a little weak this morning, but we're reading and discussing John Dowling's book, The History of Romanism, and the particular subject at hand is the discussion about the doctrine of demons, the doctrine of devils called abstaining from marriage, forbidding to marry, and uh, and how it has perverted the quote-unquote Christian faith. We find this doctrine of demons taught as orthodoxy in the Roman Catholic Church. And the effects of this doctrine of demons as taught in the Roman Catholic Church has polluted virtually all of Christianity. Everyone is subject to the negative result of this teaching of the doctrine of this doctrine of demons of uh, forbidding to marry. It has resulted in marriage and the marriage bed being reduced to well, an institution of a fallen state that chastity and perpetual virginity is the desired state. And so anyone who marries and uh, fulfills the, uh, the marriage has fallen from his virginity. And it's caused problems in the, in the married bed, the marriage bed, even to this day. Now that's a subject that this author doesn't even touch on, but I want my listeners to know that there are consequences of this doctrine of devils, this doctrine of demons forbidding to marry that has affected us all. And so we need to recognize where this doctrine of devils got its start in the Roman Catholic Church and take steps to correct it. All right. Even though it is uniquely a Roman Catholic teaching, it has affected us all. Perpetual virginity is not the chosen state that God set for man and woman. The marriage state is. Okay? We're not to be sexual virgins our whole lives. And uh, anyone who feels shame because of their marriage status and their marriage activities, is feeling their your conscience has been bound to this doctrine of demons. All right, but what else what other problems have led to? Well, the doctrine of demons led to eventually to the deification of Mary. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that it was Mary who was immaculately conceived that is, conceived without sin, and that she lived her entire life a perpetual virgin. Never mind that the Roman Catholic Church admits that Mary bore the body of the Christ child. Mary, according to Roman Catholic Orthodox teaching, was a virgin until she was miraculously assumed into heaven, which none of which is a matter of, of scriptural record. It's all man-made. It's a doctrine of devils. You wouldn't expect uh, the Bible to give evidence of a doctrine of demons, would you? That's why the Bible doesn't speak of these things. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. She gave children to Joseph after Jesus was married. She lived a normal Christian life. But that's not the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, This led to people desiring the highest state of Christian existence, that is, celibacy, forbidding to marry, abstaining from marry and sex, marrying and sexual relate, relations. And so that gave rise to nunneries and monasteries, which is the next subject of our discussion. It also became the required state for the priesthood. 
that the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church must be celibate, unmarried, and chaste, that is, asexual. It's an elevation unto, unto godlike status for the main hierarch of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's to achieve the subjugation of the people, to lord it over the people as if they were gods. The Bible also prohibits this. He said, Christ is the head of the church, and we are all brethren. We're not to lord it over one another like the Gentiles do. So, that's how the Roman Catholic Church elevates its hierarchy to godlike status in order to bring the whole world into subjection to it. All right. Now, we've done a brief reflection about what we've learned about this doctrine of demons and the, and the in, incalculable negative consequences that have resulted from it. We're going to continue now. Having concluded our discussion about the deification of Mary, we're going to proceed now to chapter 4 of the book entitled Origin of Romish Errors Continued Monkery. We're going to talk about the monasteries and the monks of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is uh, chapter 4 of book 2, and it's also subsection 21, begins at page 87 of the book, if you're following along. The author writes, Monkery, like most of the characteristics marks, uh, the characteristic marks of Antichrist, bears the most indubitable evidences of its heathen origin. Egypt, the rank soil in which it sprang up, had long been the fruitful parent of a race of gloomy, misanthropic Aramites. Okay, these are religious monks. That's a term to describe religious monks. It was in that country, Egypt, that this morose discipline had its rise. And it is observable that Egypt has in all times, as it were by an, an, an immutable law or dispensation of nature, abounded with persons of a melancholy complexion and produced in proportion to its extent more gloomy spirits than any other part of the world. Okay? Monkery was widely practiced in pagan ancient Egypt. Okay? It was here that the Essenes, we've heard about the Essenes, those who uh, killed themselves after the... Uh, the, the Roman Empire uh, destroyed Jerusalem. The Essenes and the Terraputae, those dismal and gloomy sects, dwelt principally long before the coming of Christ, as also many other of the, Asia, uh, the Asidic tribes who led by a certain melancholy turn of mind and a delusive notion of rendering themselves more acceptable to the deity by their austerities, withdrew themselves from human society and from all the innocent pleasures and comfort and, and, and rather the comforts of life. Okay, so you're beginning to understand what monkery is. It's seclusion from society to live a consecrated, dedicated, 24-7, 365 spiritual life in seclusion without enjoying any of the pleasures of life. What is it in reality? A product of the doctrine of demons. A totally wasted life. How can one serve the God of creation, who said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, raise up children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? How can these monks, these Aramites, serve a living God when they choose a life of, essentially, death. Okay, Strabo, Arian, Diodorus, Siculus, Porphyry, as well as several other of the quote-unquote fathers, especially Clement of Alexandria and Augustine, have handed down incidental notices of philosophy and manners of the Indian and Egyptian gynosophists, just another word to describe these monks, 
such as are ample sufficient for the purpose of identifying the ancient and more recent, the Buddhist and the Christian ascetic institutions. These professors of a divine philosophy, like their Christian imitators, went nearly naked. They occupied caverns or chinks in the rocks. They abstained entirely from animal food. In other words, they were vegetarian. They professed inviolable virginity. They practiced penance. They passed the greater part of the time in mute meditation. In other words, they didn't utter a sound out of their voice. They imposed silence and absolute submission upon their disciples. They professed the doctrine that the perfection of the human nature consists in an annihilation of the passions and every affection which nature has implanted, whether in the animal or in the mental constitution. Abnegation was with them the one point of wisdom and virtue and a resorption of the human soul into the abyss of the divine mind was the happy end of the present system to the pure and to the wise. Okay, so, so the greatest state of human existence, in addition to celibacy and chastity, that is forbidding to marry and, and forbidding to enjoy the sexual pleasure of marriage, is to treat oneself like an inanimate object. No speaking, no eating other than that which is absolutely necessary to sustain life, no animal food, only vegetables, and seclusion, not even uttering a sound, total silence. Now, where in the world is it ever mentioned that God made man to be, as it were, an inanimate object? And how can we serve the God of glory as if we were pillars of stone? This is a result of the doctrine of demons forbidding to marry. That there's a higher state of spiritual existence other than marriage and childbearing. And you see... When the doctrine of demons is being accepted now in the Christian world, Katie, bar the door. There's no limit to the effects, the negative effects of this doctrine of demons. And one of these, and we just got done talking about the deification of Mary, now we have monkery. Is it no wonder that the Bible calls it a doctrine of devils, forbidding to marry? Okay, subsection 22 on the top of page 88 says, Now one might reasonably have supposed and expected that a system of doctrine and practice such as this, if it were to come at all under the powerful influence of Christianity, must have admitted some extensive modifications, but it was not so. In fact, a few phrases in other dialect or a slang adopted make almost all the difference which serves to distinguish the ancient gymnosophists of the Christian uh, from the Christian anchorite. In other words, we saw heathens practice this in Egypt who were not Christians, but when this doctrine of demons began to be taught in the Christian world, it was not a whit different than what the ancient pagans did. Okay, we're going to hear some shocking things if you've never been familiar with this before. How the Christian religion produced its own monks and monasteries and how this doctrine of demons became orthodoxy in the Christian religion. He says, 
the more rigid and heroic of the Christian anchorets dispensed with all clothing except a rug or a few palm leaves around their loins. Okay, so nudity characterized many of them. All right, most of them abstained from the use of water for ablution, nor did they usually wash or change their garments that they had once put on. In other words, they once they they dedicated themselves themselves to this monkish life. They put on whatever garb they put on. That's what they lived in for the rest of their lives, and very rarely washed either their flesh or their garments. Okay, does anybody find any of this uh, in the Bible as sanctioned by God as a means of worship and service? No, this is not Christianity, and neither is Roman Catholicism. He said, most of them abstained from the use of water for ablution, nor did they usually wash or change the garments they had once put on. Thus, St. Anthony bequeathed to Anath. Uh, Athanasius, a skin in which his sacred person had been wrapped for a half a century. Okay, for 50 years in one garment of skin. He wore it for 50 years. Okay, he said they also allowed their beards and their fingernails to grow and sometimes became so hirsute as to be actually mistaken for hyenas and bears. Okay, so no grooming, no shaving, no cutting of the hair, no trimming of the fingernails. And first thing you know, they look like animals. Kind of reminds you of the curse that God placed upon Nebuchadnezzar, right? They, he ate grass on his hands and knees in the field. He wanted to worship and, and believe like an, a, 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 a brute beast, so God turned him into a brute beast. And here we see the same thing happening in, quote-unquote, Christianity. All right? They also allowed their beards and their fingernails to grow and sometimes became so hirsute, in other words, unkempt, as to be actually mistaken for hyenas and bears. It need not be said that celibacy was the first law of this institute and that an abstinence the most rigid was the second law. Okay? First of all, the doctrine of devils. Thou, you are forbidden to marry and also to abstain from sexual relations. These are the two chief doctrines of the monkish life. And that's where we see the monks and the nuns, the priests, and the whole hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church practicing as a matter of Christian faith, the doctrine of demons. And what effect that has on the godly marriage bed is incalculable. I, I, I know it makes people uncomfortable to bring this up, but we need to examine our own attitudes about our marriages and about our sexual relationships with our spouses to make sure that we are not affected by this doctrine of demons, as was early on interjected into the quote-unquote Christian religion. All right, We need to have a biblical understanding of marriage and of the marriage bed, not one imposed upon us by the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, We need to have our consciences are married and sex life consciences fashioned by the Bible and not by the sinful doctrines of men and demons. All right? There's liberty in the truth, but there's only restriction and uh, uh, laws and rules and regulations and taboos that have been placed upon the marriage bed that God never intended. All right, there should be no guilt or shame associated in the marriage life. Rome has put shame and filth into the marriage bed, made us look at our, even our married life as somehow we've fallen from the desired state. The highest state of man is celibacy, that is not married, and per perpetually chaste, a perpetual virgin. 
This comes from the doctrine of demons and has now become the orthodoxy in the Roman Catholic Church. And it has affected all of the Christian churches. <clears throat> now, continuing, he says, At what time precisely the wilderness exchanged its pagan for a Christian tenantry, it is not easy to ascertain. In some instances, no doubt, the very individuals who had begun their course as heathen uh, uh, gymnosophists ended it as Christian anchorates. In other words, some began their monkeries in the heathen philosophies and religions, but ended their monkish lives as Christians. Okay? They just took on another, a different religion. But they continued these to practice these doctrines of demons. All right? He says, But often or probably the deserted cell or cavern of the savage philosopher was taken possession of by one who, having in the neighboring cities received the knowledge of the gospel, betook himself to the angelic life in, a cons in, in consequence of persecutions or the disappointments in love or in business. So, but the emphasis is it doesn't really matter how one comes to this monkish life, whether you came to it from heathenism into Christianity, or whether you were born and bred and raised in a Christian family, but then you suffered some kind of persecution or a lack of success in the, in the normal life of, of love and business and living, you voluntarily entered into this this hermetic life, it's still the doctrine of demons. It will forever be the doctrine of demons. It's not to be practiced by anyone who calls himself a Christian. And that's why it is so wrong for anyone to call the Roman Catholic Church a Christian religion or a Christian denomination. It is what it is, and it, it will ever be what it has always been, and that is the Church of Antichrist. And we should not be surprised that it practices, as a matter of orthodoxy and doctrine and Roman Catholic canon law, celibacy for its hierarchy, for its priests, for its nuns, for its monks, the doctrine of demons. And it suffers the consequences. And it has imposed those consequences even on those of us who reject it as the synagogue of Satan. Society upholds the Catholic, the Roman Catholic teaching. And a lot of it has rubbed off onto all of us even those of us who hold strictly to the written Word of God. Okay? Now, subsection 23, the most remarkable early instances of this gloomy fanaticism on record uh, are those of Paul the Hermit, who during the persecution under Decius in about 250 A.D., betook himself to the solitary deserts of Egypt where for a space of more than 90 years he lived a life more worthy of a savage animal than of a human being. Anthony, an Egyptian, regarded as the founder of the monastic institution because he first formed monks into organized bodies who fixed his abodes in the deserts of Egypt 20 or 30 years later than Paul and died in the year 356 at the age of 105. And we have more examples of these hermetics. When we return from the break, you're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time... Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. And I have an email address for those who have comments or suggestions or questions. And an occasional criticism, you may email me. My my email address is tom at cwaves.us. And please check out the website inquisitionupdate.org. Now we're talking about this uh, doctrine of demons. We have first uh, the of uh, uh, Paul the Hermit, as he was known, Paul the Hermit, who uh, led his monkish life in 250 A.D. and he was followed on immediately by uh, the one who is regarded as the uh, the founder of the monastic life. Uh, he served in the deserts of Egypt. 20 or 30 years later than Paul the Hermit, and he died in the year 356 A.D. at the age of 105. Now another example, the one who who is called Hilarion, a Syrian youth who took up his abode on a sandy beach between the sea and the morass about 80 miles from Gaza in Palestine, where he persisted in a course of the most austere penance for about 48 years, still you can see that there's no case in the Bible where one must live 48 years in penance. This is all paganism, and it's been baptized into Christianity, and it is no such thing. He says, influenced by these eminent examples... Immense multitudes betook themselves to the desert, and innumerable monasteries were fixed in Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, and Syria. Some of the Egyptian abbots are spoken of as having had five, seven, or even ten thousand monks under their personal direction, and the Thebes, as well as certain spots in Arabia, are reported to have been literally crowded with solitaries, in other words, with monks. Nearly a 100,000 of all classes, it is said, were at one time to be found in Egypt. The Western Church probably could boast of no such swarms, at least not at this time. Now, these, however, uh, this, however, is certain that although the enthusiasm might be at a lower ebb in one country than in another, it actually affected the church universal 
so far as the extant materials of ecclesiastical history enable us to trace its rise and its progress. In the West, Martin of Tours, as he was known, founded a monastery in Poitiers and thus introduced monastic institutions into France. Okay, remember France is a Catholic country. His monks were mostly of noble families and submitted to the greatest austerities, both in food and raiment, that's clothing, and, what, and such was the rapidity of their increase that 2,000 of them attended his funeral. Okay, so a rapid growth of monkery in France. It says, in other countries, they appear to have increased in equal proportion, and the progress of monkery has been said to have equaled the rapidity of the universality of Christianity itself. Okay, say so it grew, it grew as fast as Christianity itself. Monkery, the doctrine of demons. Every province, and in the process of time, every city of the empire was filled with their increasing multitudes. Okay? Monks everywhere. Celibate, chaste monks everywhere. Okay? What, what, what do we know about this quote unquote Christianity? It's not Christianity. It's the doctrine of demons. Everywhere. It's called Christianity. Even today, without guilt. It's called Christianity. Listen, it comes to the point where we have to comp comprehend that to call Roman Catholicism Christianity is to blaspheme God. Is it not? Honestly, to call Roman Catholicism Christianity is to call God a Catholic. Doctrine of demons. Okay? Okay. This is the great falling away that Paul predicted. It had its beginnings even in, during his ministry. And for all of its progress, for all of its duration, for all of its future, it will increase in the doctrine of demons. How dare anyone call it Christianity? without defaming Christ himself. Subsection 24. We may learn the character of this fanaticism from a, a eulogy on the monastic life composed about the middle of the 4th century by Gregory Nazianzen. There were some of these men, he, he tells us, quote, who loaded themselves with iron chains in order to bear down their bodies. Isn't it funny? Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But these doctrines of demons, these who practice the doctrine of demons, load themselves with iron chains. Okay? Gregory Nanzianzen says they were those who, quote, loaded themselves with iron chains in order to bear down their bodies. Others who shut themselves up in cabins or apartments and appeared to nobody some continued 20 days and 20 nights without eating, often practicing the half of the fast of our Lord, who, saw, who fasted in the desert 40 days, according to the Scripture. One individual is said to have abstained entirely from speaking, not praising God except in thought, and another passed whole years in a church with extended hands like an animated statue yet never allowing himself to sleep. That's right, sequestered himself in a church, raised his holy hands unto heaven, and sat there for years and years and years and never slept. Is this what God intended for his people? Not at all. Not at all, ever. And the world calls it Christianity. Blaspheming the name of Christ when they do it, every time they do it. He says, one of the most renowned instances of monk repentance that is upon record is that of St. Simeon, as the priests are ple pleased to call him. St. Simeon is how he's known. 
He was a native of Syria and devoted himself to the monkish life in the virtues of which he is thought to have outstripped all that preceded him. Okay? Okay, this is the monk of monks. All right, St. Simeon of the Roman Catholic Church, you are not going to believe this story. He says, we are told that he lived 60, or rather 6 and 30 years, that is 36 years, on a pillar, a pillar of stone, an inanimate object, a pillar of stone. He lived atop a pillar of stone erected on the summit of a high mountain in Syria, from which he obtained the name Simeon Stylites, or Simeon, a pillar. Okay. From this pillar, it is said, he never descended except to take possession of another pillar, which he did four times, having in the whole occupied five pillars in all. Okay? In other words, he moved five times in his life from one pillar to the next. He stood atop stone pillars. That was his service to God, okay? It says, on his last pillar which was loftier than any of the former pillars, being 60 feet high and 3 feet broad, that's one yard, 36 inches wide at the top. He remained there, according to report, 15 years without intermission. 15 years he lived on top of that pillar, just 36 inches wide, summer and winter, day and night, exposed to all the inclemencies of the weather in a climate subject to great and sudden changes from the most sultry heat to the most piercing cold. It is said that he always stood. In other words, he stood erect on his feet on top of this pillar, and he said the breadth of his pillar didn't permit him to lie down. You can imagine trying to lie down on a 36-inch diameter disc on top of that pillar. Okay? He spent the day until 3 in the afternoon in meditation and prayer. From that time till sunset, he harangued the people who flocked to him from all the countries, whom he had then dismissed with his benediction. He would on no account suffer females to come within his precincts. Why? Because they were filthy. Right? Especially married ones. They practice sex, don't they? How disgusting. He said he would in no account suffer females to come within his precincts, not even his own mother, who he said through mortification and grief at at being refused admittance, to have died on the third day of her arrival. This bereaved woman heard about her son, went to see him, and he wouldn't talk to her, wouldn't see her. And she died of grief, obviously. He said he would on no account suffer females to come within his precincts, not even his own mother, who is said through mortification and grief at being refused admittance to have died on the third day of her arrival. To show how indefatigable he was in whatever conduced to the glory of God and to the good of mankind, he spent much time daily in the exemplary exercise of bowing so low as to make his forehead strike his toes, and so frequently that one who went to see him, as Theodoret, the ancient ecclesiastical historian, relates, counted no fewer than 1,244 times he bowed. And says, when being more wearied in numbering than the saint was in bowing, he gave over the task of counting. In other words, he just simply stopped counting at 1,244 times. Here's this monk, all of his human life, standing upon the top of pillars, bowing until his forehead struck his toes. And that's how he lived life, in service to God, of course. 
That's how he lived life. He was a Catholic monk. He's venerated even to this day in the Roman Catholic Church. He says, for such, sens for such senseless and disgusting practices as these has this poor victim of superstition been enrolled among the calendar of saints in the Roman Catholic Church and down to the present day whenever Romish writers refer to this famous pillar saint as he is known they speak of him with the greatest reverence as Saint Simeon okay would you still like to call it a Christian church the greatest of the saints of the Roman Catholic Church wasted his life on top of pillars bowing is that service to God? He lived a celibate. Hated women. Even his own mother. Is that Christianity? Subsection 25, up to nearly the close of the 5th century, the monks had generally lived only in solitary retreats. And regarded as they were as laymen, they had entertained no thoughts of assuming any rank among the sacerdotal order, in other words, the priesthood. They just like being monks, of course, you know. They didn't want to be preachers or priests or any such thing. You know, they'd have to associate with other people if they did that. He says, now, however, they found themselves in a condition to claim an eminent station among the pillars of the Christian community. Okay? They wouldn't stoop so low as being a priest, but they wanted, their, they wanted status. All right? He said the mistaken piety of many led them to erect spacious and, commo uh, and uh, commodious edifices for the accommodation of monks and holy virgins, more resembling the palaces of princes than the rude cells of primitive monks. And at the epoch of papal supremacy, these monasteries were numerous and powerful, especially in the neighborhood of large cities. The monks who dwelt in these convents were called Cenobites, from two Greek words signifying to live in common. Okay? So now there's a transformation taking place. The celibates, the woes who live under the doctrine of demons, are elevated to edifices, large, expensive, spacious edifices. Not standing outside in the weather on pillars. They've got power and notoriety now. And it says, When these spacious edifices were supplied with a numerous fraternity, governed by an abbot of eminence and character, so-called, from a Syriac word signifying father, there often arose a jealousy between the abbot of the monastery on the one hand and the bishop on the other in whose diocese the abbey was situated, and to whom, as things stood at first, the abbot and the friars owned spiritual subjection. Okay? So the most powerful man in the Roman Catholic locality is the bishop. But these, mono, these, these monks in the monasteries didn't want to be his subjects anymore. Okay, and it says, out of their mutual jealousies sprang umbrages, and these sometimes terminated in quarrels and injuries. In such cases, the abbots had the humiliating disadvantage to be under the obligation of canonical obedience to him, that is the bishop, as the ordinary of the place with whom they were at variance that they might deliver themselves from the inconveniences, real or pretended, and might be independent of their rivals, they applied to Rome one after another for a release from this slavery, they called it, by being taken under protection of St. Peter. Now, who do you suppose is St. Peter in the Roman Catholic Church? Why, of course, the successor of St. Peter, that is the Pope. So these monks, mostly of noble families, whose history is nothing but dirty, long fingernails and hair and putrid, disgusting apparel, are now put up in great monasteries. 
And now they don't want to be subject to the bishop anymore. They want to be direct subjects of St. Peter, who is the Pope. They want to answer to the Pope and the Pope only. And it says the proposal was with avidity. Avidity accepted at Rome. That politic court saw immediately that nothing could be better calculated for supporting papal power but then to admit the monkish orders to direct subservancy to the papacy bypassing the bishops. Okay? So what do we know about all the monkish orders? Including the Jesuits, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, Opus Dei, all the monkish orders, what do we know about them? They're the Pope's vassals. They serve the Pope. They are warrior monks for the Pope. The Pope immediately recognized the potential for their service in helping to support and to extend the papal power. So what do we know about monkish orders? The purpose for their existence is to extend the papal power. That's what they're for. That's for what they were created. Extension of the papal power. That's their whole purpose for existing. To extend the papal power everywhere. Wherever there are monkish orders, that's where the papal power is being extended. Do you have monks, nuns, monasteries, nunneries in your locality or in your state? or in your parish, or in your providence, or in your county, they are there to extend the papal power. That's the purpose for their existence. And where is there not monks in the United States of America? He says, that politic court saw immediately, that is, the papal court saw immediately that nothing could be better calculated for supporting the papal power than for the pope to take under his direct supervision the monastic orders. He says, whoever abstains, uh, ob obtains privileges is obliged in order to secure his privileges to maintain the authority of the grantor. Okay? This is just an elaborate way of saying, if you take something from someone else as a gift, you are obliged to serve the gift giver. Okay? We know our states take handouts from the federal government in education, welfare, all of it. And so the states become subservient to the federal government. Otherwise, the money's cut off. Well, in this case, the monks took as a gift sole supervision by the successor of Peter, thus bypassing the bishops and their quote-unquote slavery. And so now they are obliged to serve the Pope, the one who gave them this gift of freedom from the, from the bishop. So they maintain the authority of the Pope. And if they cease to serve the Pope, they lose their liberty and they come back under the supervision of the bishop. So now you understand. And it's, it's, it's all, the, the ancient concept that is the, cre the, the debtor is a slave of the creditor. If you take something... As a gift, you're obliged to serve. And that's the case of the monastic orders and the papacy. The monastic orders received relief from the tyrannical rule of the bishops and became directly subservient to the papacy. And so they helped to maintain, the pap maintain and ex extend the superior power of the Pope wherever they exist as service to the Pope who gave them liberty from the bishops. 
Subsection 26, very quickly, all the monasteries, great and small, abbeys, priories, and nunneries were exempted from the jurisdiction of the bishops. The two last were inferior sorts of monasteries and often subordinate to some abbey. Even the chapters of cathedrals, consisting mostly of regulars on the like pretexts, on the like pretexts obtained exemption. Finally, whole orders, such as the Benedictines, who were established in the 6th century, and others were exempted. This effectually procured a prodigious argumentation, augmentation rather, to the pontifical authority, which now came to have a sort of disciplined troops in every place, defended and protected by the papacy, who in return were its defenders and protectors, serving as spies on the bishops as well as on the secular powers. Okay, now you've heard me talk about the shadow government. I just told you who they are. This author just told you who they are. He says, this effectually procured a prodigious augmentation to the pontifical authority, which now came to have a sort of disciplined troops in every place, defended and protected by the papacy, who in return were its defenders and protectors, serving as spies on the bishops as well as on the secular powers, that is, the governments. They're the Pope's spies over the bishops and even over the civil powers. That's what the monastic orders are. They've infiltrated every country. And they overshadow every government. Even the governors of the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops. Interesting, isn't it? We'll have more tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I'll see you then. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.